Time to get that multitask and 100 billion neuron connecting priority arranging segment of your wonderfully constructed brain to contemplate this. Ever wonder how many handshakes take place in a day? How many hugs happen? How many one-to-one face-to-face conversations go on? What about glances, kisses, laughs, and prayers? Ways we connect. And you, right there, right now. How are you connected to the person next to you? The people around you? Your friends, your enemies, the strange dude at the mall? How about the movies you watch, the books you read, the messages all around you? And how do you connect differently than people connected in the past? So many thoughts, ideas, blogs, texts, posts, and tweets these days. Everybody wants to connect to someone or something. And the world wide web of intersection and connection has changed everything. Get this. One out of eight couples married in the U.S. in 2008 met through social media. Unfortunately, half will be divorced in five years, connected and disconnected. There are over 500 million active Facebook users who spend over 700 billion minutes per month clicking, posting, uploading, and downloading. An average user is connected to 80 community pages, groups, and events, and each person creates 90 pieces of content each month. Folks got a lot to share, a lot to say. So much that the average user spends 55 minutes per day, 6.5 hours per week, or about 1.3 full days per month on Facebook. And that's just people sitting around home because more than 200 million are on Facebook through mobile phones nowadays because long lost are the days of landline phones, busy tones, and yeah, David Jones. And speaking of cell phones, in 2004, 674 million were sold, which is 105 million less than the 779 million sold in 2005, which is nothing compared to the almost 4 billion sold in the last three years. Some people in the world who don't have toilets or houses have cell phones. People really want to connect. But wait, there's more. One trillion text messages were sent in 2008, 1.5 trillion in 2009, and then it went up to 6.1 trillion just recently. That's a thousand texts per person for every person on the planet. That's a lot of connecting. Yet this hasn't even scratched the surface. There's over 50 million tweets per day, over 60 million LinkedIn people, and 43 million people still visit MySpace per month. Then there's however many millions on Ning, Tag, Meetup, Bebo, My Yearbook, and Friendster looking at everything from posts to pics to video. Speaking of which, it would take you over 27 years without sleeping to watch all the videos uploaded on YouTube just this week. Everybody wants to connect. Connect with a friend. Connect with family. Connect to the past. Connect to the future. Connect to God. Hmm. Connect with God. The one who created connections, voices, images, ears, eyes, smiles, kisses, glances, faces, friends, music, color, stars, electricity, light, laughter, and love, just to name a few? Connect with him? Now what does that mean? Well, you connect the dots. Welcome back to God Connect. Thank you. We are live streaming from Hillsboro Seventh-day Adventist Church in the Portland, Oregon area. And I have some good news. We have many, many visitors online watching this uh, from Germany, Italy, Romania, Austria, France, Norway, Spain, India, uh, Puerto Rico, and all over America. So I want to thank you guys personally. Uh, Thank you for... uh, connecting with us and we also would like to um, hear from you uh, through chat so uh, if we are opening the chat right now so if you could let us know where you're viewing from we'd love to hear from you and did you guys know that we also have a facebook please like us on facebook and at this time what i would like to do is present uh, larissa she will be doing the health nugget thank you larissa Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy that you all are joining us tonight. We are going to watch another short video by Dr. Randy Bivens. He will share with us the meaning of temperance. Enjoy. Though this was said in the early 80s, I'm Dr. Randy Bivens. Joy, temperance, and repose slammed the door on the doctor's nose. Although this was said in the early 1800s by Longfellow, it's as relevant as ever today. Think about it. Too much of anything is bad. Even drinking too much water can be deadly. Wouldn't you agree that we need to keep our habits in check? Take the sun, for example. Sunlight is a great example of moderation for health. It only takes a few minutes of full exposure in the middle of the day to convert adequate amounts of vitamin D. Yet, while enjoying 20 to 30 minutes in the sun can have an amazingly positive influence on our mood, spending too much time in the sun can lead to sunburn and even cancer. 
Some of you may associate the word temperance with the temperance movement of the 1800s, which, among other things, urged or prohibited the consumption of alcoholic beverages. But temperance is much more than avoiding alcohol or limiting yourself to one lump of sugar in your tea. Try to think of temperance as a state of mind wherein you seek to practice balance with your body and your passions. It's really an age-old conflict, stretching back to ancient Greece and even to the dawn of mankind. If you remember the story, the first humans, Adam and Eve, struggled with intemperance in diet and wound up eating the forbidden fruit. So how do we practice moderation in our own lives? As mentioned earlier, we need to figure out how to control our bodies and our actions. An extremely challenging place to do this is in our diets. Obesity in much of the advanced world is becoming a widespread public health issue that if left unchecked will soon become the leading cause of death. So when it comes to your food choices, think and choose temperately. Eat enough to sustain your physical needs and choose nutrient rich foods that will make your body happy. Other products that stimulate our senses like nicotine, caffeine and depressants like alcohol are another subject I'd like to touch on. Historically, temperance had a strong association with alcohol. Recently, many scientific studies have been conducted on the health benefits of drinking small amounts of alcohol, but they haven't done much but muddy the waters. One long-standing truth remains clear. What starts as occasional or light drinking can quickly become a habit, and habitual drinking is clearly a health hazard. Because of this, although we're talking about moderation, I think alcohol might be an area where total abstinence is a better choice. When it seems like our lives are spinning out of control, temperance can help us regain direction. It is about balance and control, remember? In our exceedingly digital world, most, if not all of us, could probably spend much of the day with our eyes glued to some form of screen. Where's the life in that? Where's the joy? Practice temperance with your reliance on technology and take a moment to collect your thoughts and simply breathe. Spend a little extra time with your friends and family and engage in a real conversation without a television blurring in the background. The true key to living a temperate lifestyle lies in our minds. We need to learn to safeguard our thoughts and carefully monitor our emotions. If you're the type to give rise to anger easily, take a few deep breaths and learn the power of forgiveness. If you're prone to bragging, give way to more humble conversation. If you're the judgmental type, give compassion or empathy a try. Think of your mind as a springboard for all of your actions. If you can learn to use your mind carefully and wisely, you will have won the battle against intemperance. Thank you so much, Larissa, for the video. Next, we have, we'll continue Hi. with our special guest is here actually today from Germany, and it is Heidi, and she will be playing with Benita and Florine, and this is a wonderful musical presentation titled, Hold Thou My Hand.
Amen. Thank you very much. A lovely song by three lovely ladies. Thank you. That was very nice. Okay. Well, yesterday, today actually, is part five of the series. And yesterday, we talked about war in heaven. It was about how we were given the freedom of choice and how God loves us so much. And, you know, we have this free gift of salvation, and I really, I really like it when it's free. Don't you, everybody? Amen. I love free. And even though he, he did something wonderful on the cross that, uh, that we can't, words can't even explain how wonderful, you know, what, how wonderful he is to us and what he did for us. Well, today we're going to be talking about fall of humanity. And I would like to ask Pastor Vio Rosca to come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mimi. Good evening, everyone. How's God treating you today? I hope he's treating you good, and I hope you're able to see that. And same goes with you watching online. I hope God treated you good today. If it's evening for you or if it's morning, I hope God will give you a great day today. And if you're going to watch this later on, uh, recorded, whatever time of the day it is, I hope you enjoy it and realize that God is working in your life. Last night we talked about the, the war in heaven, how it started and why we have evil and suffering. Tonight we're going to learn how we ended up in the wrong camp. We've learned last night that there were two camps, two sides of the war in heaven. And uh, as I said, we're going to discover tonight that the human race as a whole and each of us as individuals are living in the throes of a perceptual, relational, and moral fall from the beauty of our original state. We were not supposed to be in this state, but we found ourselves on the wrong side of the battle, in the wrong camp. Perceptual, relational, and moral fall. What are you talking about, Vio? Well, let's see what the Bible says. At the psychological core of the fallen human condition, there lies a deeply embedded perceptual distortion. We all naturally harbor some significant degree of apprehension about God due to the primal lie that was received into human consciousness by our first parents, Adam and Eve. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to see how this perception, that lie, was disseminated towards Adam and Eve. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree? of the garden verse 2 and the woman said to the serpent we may eat f the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it lest you die then the serpent said to the woman you will not surely die for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. A perceptual fall. First, let's identify who we're dealing with here. The serpent. Who is the serpent in this account? The serpent is none other than Satan, the fallen angel we learned about last night. We profiled extensively. Revelation 12 verse 9 makes it clear when it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with 
him. Satan approached humanity with the intent to deceive. This is why he is called cunning. The target of his deception is what exactly? Where did it all start? We think of, of sin, of the fall, as something that happened when, when Eve did take the first bite of the fruit. But did it start there? No, it doesn't start there. The target of his deception was the human mind, is the human mind every single time. And his subject of deception is what exactly? What is the core truth that defines everything else? What is the accusation that Satan brings towards God? That God is not love. So the target of his deception is the character of God because the character of God is love. First, he suggests that God is restrictive. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Actually, God said no such thing. And we know from the response that Eve gave, and we know what the Bible says. He had in fact framed the human situation as one of expansive freedom with one minor restriction. And that only for the protection of humanity from harmful consequences. And you'll read that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Satan came along and in a very subtle way reframed God's word to convey the idea of total restriction with, with freedom dropped completely from the picture. So here you have God on one side that gives almost limitless freedom to the first couple, the first human beings, saying only of this tree you cannot eat. Lots of freedom. And Satan twists it and says, no, God told you, has God actually, uh, did God tell you that you were not supposed to eat from any of the trees? Eve should have seen it. Secondly, Satan portrayed God as untrustworthy, as a liar, when, when he says, you will not surely die. God says you will, but you won't. Thirdly, the third stage in this percep perceptual fall, and this is the bottom line of the deception, Satan painted God as self-serving, suggesting that he holds a monopoly on a higher state of being that humanity might access if God weren't keeping it for himself. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, he projects towards God what has taken place into his heart. Self-serving. The crucial point to grasp is that the sin problem that we're dealing with began with deception regarding the kind of person God is. That's the starting point. Essentially, Satan denied that God is love and misrepresented the creator as a selfish tyrant, which brings us to the relational aspect of the fall. A relational. Once the primal lie was received into the mind or believed, relational breakdown immediately followed. I would like to invite you to, to grab your Bible as we continue in the Genesis account. In chapter 3 of Genesis, continue with uh, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees 
of the garden. Then the Lord called, the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. First, we see that the vertical relationship was broken. God and humanity were separated. Because they no longer believed in the integrity of God's love, they ceased to trust God and ventured out in self-preserving rebellion against him. Then, as a direct result, the horizontal relationship between human beings fell apart. When given a chance to take responsibility, what do they do? They pass it on to the next person. The new natural impulse, it's interesting how it's happening. They already had it within themselves. The new natural impulse was to defend self by casting blame on one another and ultimately cast, casting blame on who? On God himself. The woman, who, who gave the woman to Adam? And he is adamant about uh, making that point, you know. The woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit to eat. Casting blame ultimately on God. Once they cross this line, an immediate sense of nakedness or guilt came upon them because now they were living the lie and moving behaviorally in violation against the very design of their nature, a design that dictated that they live in relational love and trust, which was now broken. And this leads us to the third aspect of the fall, a moral fall. Paul gives us a clear understanding of what sin is when he says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What exactly does it mean to, to fall short of the glory of God? In the Bible, the word glory refers to the radiant outshining of what makes God who God is at heart. It's the inner content of God's character shining outward in his deeds. It's the way God thinks and feels and behaves. We read in Exodus chapter 33, verses 18 and 19. And he said, please show me your glory. This is Moses who is asking God, please show me your glory. Then he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And later on, if you have time, go, when you go home, look into your Bible and see uh, later on in the passage when, when God passes, is revealing his glory to Moses and he puts him in the cleft of the rock, actually, so he would not be able to see God's face, otherwise he would die. The way God is described is nothing but a description of his character. The glory of God is his character. When Paul says that sin is constituted in falling short of God's glory, he is defining sin as disharmony with the basic essence of God's character, which the Bible defines as self-giving love, 1 John 4, 8. So what is sin? Sin is anything that runs contrary to God's character and thus violates the integrity of his love. This is what sin is. The comparison of the following two scriptures uh, shed, uh, sheds additional light on the precise nature of sin. What does it say? First John 3, 4. Sin is what? Transgression of the law. And Romans 13, 10 says that love is the fulfillment of the law. You see the opposite sides, sin and love? 
sin, transgression of the law, love, fulfillment of the law. A moral fall. The fall of mankind involves moral derangement. God had created humanity to live in love, in a relational faithfulness. The fall resulted in turning human beings into creatures of anti-love, relational violation. We hurt one another. We cross moral lines and we tend to do what fulfills our individual urges at the expense of others. We pretty much don't care about others when we are led by our natural, sinful human nature and impulse. In short, the fall of humankind was and is entailed in selfishness taking the place of love as our core motivational impulse. That's why we sin, because we ceased to love the way God designed us to love. By contrast, in Christ, we see the crystal truth, clear truth, crystal clear truth about God. You shall know the truth, he said, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Not truths in general or in the abstract, but the truth, singular, about God's character in contrast to the lie, singular, that Satan had, has disseminated regarding God. Speaking to the religious leaders of his day, Jesus highlighted the singular nature of the lie they had believed in contrast to the truth he embodied. He says in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Truth, singular, lie, singular. We don't have a sins problem. We have a sin problem, singular. And the sin problem that we have is that we ceased to love and we are not in the truth. Notice the connection between deception, desires, and deeds. It's a circular connection, you will see. It comes back. Buying into Satan's lie regarding the character of God generates antagonistic desires towards God which in turn produce rebellious actions against God. Our thoughts, our beliefs, determine our feelings, which determine our actions, which reinforce our thoughts. And we keep going again. Thoughts, beliefs, feelings, actions, which reinforce our thoughts. The fall of mankind began with believing falsehood regarding God, which then led to broken trust or emotional disconnect from God, which then led to moral, rebe moral rebellion on the behavioral level. That's how it goes. That's what's happening every single day when we fall apart from God. Jesus passed over the same ground as Adam and Eve and maintained integrity on both the vertical and the horizontal planes. He remained faithful to God and to us, as Satan came to our first parents uh, in a subtle way, tempting them to doubt God's love and cease trusting him, so also he came to Christ. I would like again to invite you to, to grab your Bible. <clears throat> I will not have the Bible verses on the screen, so you'll have to look it for yourself this time in the scripture. It's kind of intentional. So, so we use our Bibles. This is actually the source. You read in, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, the account of the temptation of Jesus. Satan came not only to Adam and Eve, he came to Jesus trying to tempt him. And according to the account given here, the devil's attack on Jesus took the form of three temptations. In the first two, what is Satan trying to do? You will find them in verse 3. And then in verse 6, what does it say in verse 3? Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, 
If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. In verse 6 it says, And said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And then he goes on quoting the Bible, because in the first temptation Jesus responded with the Bible verse. What Satan trying to do here? He is seeking to drive a wedge between Jesus and the Father by casting doubt upon their relationship. If you are the Son of God. In other words, you're in a predicament, Jesus. But if the Father does love you, then surely he'll relieve your suffering and protect you from harm. If Jesus had doubted the Father's love, he would have yielded to the temptation and a certain independence from the Father. By his confidence in God's love, but, but his confidence in God's love remained unbroken. In the third temptation, so the first two temptations had to deal with the vertical uh, connection. The third temptation has to deal with the horizontal one. Christ, in the third temptation, Christ was pressed by Satan to acknowledge his dominance over humanity by worshiping him. If Jesus had yielded, it would have amounted to an abandonment of humanity for purposes of self-exaltation. But his love for us remained constant. Jesus retraced the steps of our first parents and redeemed their failures. In him, complete relational integrity is restored. And here we come to the point where I'm asking that you look at Jesus, look at God, at who he is, as a person of love and make a decision. It is my desire to experience restored trust in my heart toward God by believing the truth of his love for me. It starts there. You cannot change your life. I cannot change my life unless I believe that God loves me. It started there when Satan somehow induced the idea to Adam and Eve that God does not love. It has to be there. It is my desire to experience restored trust in my heart toward God by believing the truth of his love for me. First Timothy, the second chapter, verse 4, it says, God desires all men to be saved and to, the, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What kind of truth are we talking about here? Are we talking a set of doctrines? which are important, beliefs are important. We're talking about truth, singular, not truths, plural. The knowledge of the truth is God desires all men to be saved and to come back to the knowledge of the fact that God is love. The knowledge of the truth that we are loved by God. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to build back and restore the broken relationship. Coming to know not merely factually, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in an experiential way, the truth of who God really is will save us from the perceptual, relational, and the moral effects of the fall. I would like to thank God for making his true character known through Christ. In Christ Jesus, we see that God indeed is love. That's why Jesus was able to say, I am the truth. I came to reveal you the Father. I came to reveal to you who God is, a God of love. It is my prayer that the desire becomes yours as well, that you will accept to come back into knowing the truth about God and his character and his love. I would like to invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that though we are in a fallen state, we have hope. And while we cannot do it on our own, and we're going to learn about that, we pray that you will give us all the help that we need, all the direction that we need to be able to come back into understanding who you are. Understand that you love us and that you want to be connected with us.
not separated. We suffer the consequences of the fall. We are, on all levels, fallen beings. But through your grace, we can be changed. Help us to see your character and be willing to be transformed, to accept the truth about you and not believe the lies that Satan is trying to put into our minds. Please reveal yourself to us and help us to choose you. For we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This concludes tonight's meeting. I would like to remind you that tomorrow night we're meeting at the same time, 707, either here in person at the Hill, Hillsboro Seventh-day Adventist Church or online at God Connect. And uh, I would like to remind you that the chat room is open if you would like to tell us where you're coming from, where you're watching from, if you have any questions, and if they are of a private nature, you can connect, us, uh, connect with us through uh, God Connect on Facebook. Tomorrow night, the promised one, God's response to the fall of humanity. We're going to learn about the Lamb of God. Have a good night, everyone. May God bless you wherever you are.